open your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians. We'll be in chapter 4, and you might want to get ready to open your Bibles to Acts 19. We'll be there also. It's wonderful to be able to address myself to the subject assigned. We're in one of the most foundational subjects that's in your Bible, and it's groundwork upon which the superstructure of the Church of Christ and her unity stands. Marvelous words. Listen carefully to verse 4 beginning. Paul has set down in verses 1 through 3 the wonderful attitude, the spirit of unity. And he says in Ephesians 4, 3, keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now how do we get the unity of the spirit? Verse 13, he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints until we attain to the unity of the faith. The unity of the Spirit and the unity of the faith is the same thing. The Spirit gave it to us through the Word that defines the faith, the entire body of apostolic doctrine. Then he moves from verse 3 into what now is verse 4, and he gives seven absolutes, facts. He says, there is one body, one Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one immersion, that's the way that should have been translated, one God and Father of all, who's over all, through all, and in all. Marvelous words written to a church that had problems in division. We'll express that momentarily. Right now, the challenge of the student of Ephesians is to try to determine why the Apostle Paul even wrote the letter of Ephesians. Why did he say, what he said. Why did he say there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism? What for? Why? What brought it out? What's back of him being guided by the Spirit to make these statements? This is what we need to get back of because there's nothing in the book of Ephesians as there is in Colossians that brings out a statement as to why he writes the book. It's all a positive thing. There's not a complete, there is no expose of a doctrine a false doctrine or a false doctor, it isn't there. And so why did he say what he said? Well, there are some strong indications in the book. With a real study of it, you'll begin to pick out there are reasons that begin to emerge from your study that you're just confident he addresses himself to. Now, the first thing I want to say is the letter is written to Gentile Christians. It wasn't written to Jewish Christians, which doesn't mean that Jews who became Christians could not have the blessings that are here. Of course they could. The point is he's writing to Gentile Christians. Now look at chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. We who before hoped in Christ, now there's the Jews. Here's all those Messianic Old Testament prophecies. The Jews were looking forward to the coming of the one Lord, the Messiah. And then he says, in whom you also, having heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Who's that you also? That's Gentiles. Now look down here at chapter 2, verse 11. He says, wherefore, remember that once ye, the Gentiles in the flesh, he's talking to Gentiles. Now look at chapter 3, verse 1. He says, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord, in behalf of you Gentiles, if so be, you've heard of the dispensation of that grace of God that was given me to you word. He's talking to Gentiles in chapter 3 and in verse 3. He says, how that by revelation was made known to me the mystery. And in verse 6, he defines the mystery. He says, to wit, that the Gentiles were fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. What's this fellow heirs? Fellows with who? The saints? Israelites who were Christians, fellow members of the body. What body? The body of chapter 2 he just got through saying is the body of the reconciled. And then he states here, and their fellow partakers of the promise. What promise? The grand promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3 and 22, 18, that in his seed would come a worldwide blessing. Christ is the seed, Galatians 3, 16, and the blessing is justification by the grace of God through faith in Christ, Galatians 3, 8. And so we're seeing here that he has addressed this letter to Gentiles. 
Well, it's not finished. Look over here at verse 8, chapter 3, verse 8. He says, Unto me whom less than the least of all saints was this grace given to preach unto the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And we could go on. This letter is addressed to Gentile Christians. Now, why is it addressed to Gentiles? I think you're going to find out that there was a distinct disunity, a division between Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. We could speculate as to why. We don't know. But I think it's very obvious. What emerges from chapter 2 is that Paul is addressing himself to a disunified body. Now, I won't go into it very deep, but the idea that the book of Ephesians is addressed to the Ephesian church might be held in abeyance because in the most ancient manuscript copies, the Sinaiticus, the Vaticanus, uh, the Alexandrinus, I believe that's right, uh, the word at Ephesus isn't there. So we raise the question, why is the term at Ephesus in the opening verses, if it wasn't there originally, unless it started at Ephesus, went around through Western Asia Minor to the churches there and came back to Ephesus. And maybe as time went on, the, a scribe put Ephesus in the marginal reading, and somebody moved it on into the text of some ancient manuscripts. And so really, when I say the book of Ephesians is written to these people in Western Asia Minor, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. Now, with this in mind, then, we're going to see in chapter 2. Look at verse 11 beginning. Now, read this carefully. He says, Wherefore, remember that once you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which you call circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that you are at that time separate from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise. What was their condition? Without hope, without God, in the world. Whew! Terrible. And I can just see some of these Jews who became Christians looking down their 1,500-year-old snobbish nose and making fun of these Gentiles because we are the chosen people, and they were second-class Christians. Now, that may have been the idea. One thing shines out to me. He says, these Jews, these Gentiles to whom he's writing, need to find out who they really are and how valuable they are to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says in verse 14, Christ is our peace, who made both Jew and you one. Look at that. He break down the middle wall of partition, having abolished in his flesh the law of commandments contained in ordinances. What to do with the great law of Moses that made a distinction between Jew and Gentile? You know, you read over there in the 147th Psalm, verse 19 and 20, God says, I have not given these testimonies to any nation at all. The only one that ever received the law of Moses was Israel. And they took that and they became covenant-related children of God. So that made a distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Paul says God has now taken away the law. He's abolished it. It served its wonderful purpose. Now then, are the Jews the special people of God today? Absolutely not. The church of Christ, including Gentiles from all over the world. Even as Abraham stated a long time ago, in thy seed, said he, shall all the nations be blessed. And the blessing is to be received by any Gentile who becomes as valuable to our blessed Lord Jesus as any Jew that ever became a Christian. And we need to understand that and help some of these millenarians today that just don't seem to get that point. With that in mind, then come down here to verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that he might create in himself of the two, both Jew and you, one new man, a new humanity, brand new, not Jew, not Gentile, not black, not white, not tan, not yellow, Christian, one new humanity. And if the church of Christ adopts this, there's a whole lot of problems that sink and die. And we have a grand unity when we understand that. And so he goes on to say, and that he might reconcile them both in one body unto God through the cross, having slain the enmity, the ill will, thereby. And he came and preached peace to them that were afar off, that's us. Peace to them that were nigh, that's the Jews. And he says that we both have our access unto one Father in one spirit 
through the Lord Jesus Christ. What's the access? In the Greek, that's the word prosagoge. Look that up in your lexicon. Look it up in your Bible dictionary. That was the person who, uh, in the, in, from the worldly vantage point, had the ability of introducing to the king only the right people. <laughs> and so our Lord Jesus introduces us into the very presence of the mighty king. Jehovah is his name. What a wonderful thing it is. And so you're seeing here that this type of language indicates he is buoying up. He's trying to get these Gentiles to see they're not second-class Christians. Not by any means, regardless of what your, Gen your Jewish brethren are telling you. And so in this, we're beginning to see that there was a division there that Paul addresses himself to. So what does he do? He appeals to seven absolutes. Facts. There is one body, one Lord, one faith. Now, I'm going to emphasize one Lord and ask the question, hope that we answer it correctly, and that is, how does this one Lord, Jesus Christ, contribute to the unity of the body of Christ in Western Asia Minor? And how would that principle applied do the same thing to churches that are divided today. Hmm? As we look at this, he says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. Now what's the difference between the Lord and the God? There's no difference in the person. Just like when Jesus was standing before Thomas, and Thomas saw in the resurrected body of Jesus the prints of the crucifixion. And as he saw them, he deducted what could only be deducted. He said, what? my Lord and my God. So they're the same person. Now Jesus is Lord, Jesus is God, but we're speaking of God the Father over here, the architect and the fountainhead of all the blessings we receive in Christ in Ephesians 4. What's the difference then? I would think that God here, the one God is deity. That's his nature. And as our brother yesterday set forth in such clear and capable terms, set forth what it means to be, it means to have one God contributing to the unity of his people. What's the difference in between the one God and the one Lord? The difference is between the nature of deity that's emphasized and the lordship authority of Jesus Christ. We're talking about his authority. There's the idea. Now, if you'll turn with me to a couple of passages of Scripture, look over here at the book of John, chapter 5. Look there at verse 22 beginning. He says, Neither doth the Father judge any man. He hath given all judgment unto the Son, even as uh, he's given all judgment unto the Son, that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father that sent him. Now, how is Jesus, who is the judge, God has given all judgment to the Son. How is Jesus going to distribute, how is he going to officiate that judgment? He says in John, the 12th chapter, and in verse 48, He that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my word, as one that judges him. The word that I spake, the same, shall judge him in the last day. And so we're speaking here of the authoritative word of the one Lord. And when people are divided, they've got to come together upon the book, upon the message in the text. They've got to have the Word of God. There's the idea. And that will bring people who respect that authority, respect that Lordship authority. That's how they can reunify. There's the idea of one Lord. Turn with me to the book of Matthew. <laughs> Look at chapter 8, beginning in verse 5, you have a Roman centurion whose servant is sick. And he heard about Jesus, and he sent for him. And Jesus said, I'll go and heal him. And he didn't get all the way there before the centurion sent friends to him, Jewish friends, uh, who recommended the centurion to Jesus. And he said, Lord, he said, I'm not worthy for you to come under my, my roof. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. And then he said, For I am also a man under authority. For I say to one, Go, and he goeth, and I say to another, Come, and he cometh. He understood the authority of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. There's the idea. Not every man that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom, but he that doeth 
the will of my Father. And so in Luke 6, 46, why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So the Lordship of Jesus, I think, is exactly what Paul is referring to here when he states there's one body and one spirit. Even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord. And this was to contribute to the situation that existed in Western Asia Minor among all these churches in the Ephesian area. One Lord with his authority. Look at Luke chapter 12, verses 41 and 42. Jesus is told a parable. Peter comes to him. And Peter said, Lord, did you tell this parable to all or just unto us? And Jesus answered by saying, Who is that faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has set over his household? Here you have Jesus talking about a man referring to another man as Lord. The idea is authority. Here was a man who had a household. He probably had land. And as a result, he had the authority over his employees you see, there's the idea of lordship. We need to understand that the Lord really carries the idea. It's not a name, folks. Well, it is. You know, Exodus, the third chapter, this is my name, the Lord, Jehovah, depending on your translation. But Jesus Christ, the Lord, has the authority and exercises that authority through his word. So we're looking then at the source of the only authority there is not only for salvation, but for the unifying of the body of Jesus Christ. So, why did Paul say there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God? Didn't they know that? And yet you look at it. He says, there is one Lord. There is one immersion. Well, didn't they have to know that and believe that in order to become Christians in the first place? There's one God. Yeah. But these people in Western Asia, as it was all over the Roman Empire, were pagans, worshipers of many gods. In order to become a member of the church in Ephesus, folks, you had to become a believer in Jesus. That took conversion. Now, we find that they were converted out of paganism, out of one God. We know that they were baptized, Ephesians 5, verse 25 and 6. Husbands, love your wives as Christ. Love the church, gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it, having cleansed it by the washing of water with the word. And so these people had to be converted to that. Well, why is he telling them, now folks, there's just one Lord and one faith, if they already knew it, unless they were getting away from it. Ah. And so we're going to have to get some background here to uh, this Ephesian letter, and we want to go back to Acts, the 19th chapter, and get some history here that's really going to help us understand the Ephesian statement, the Ephesian letter. We find that there was Apollos who in Acts 18 came to Ephesus. He was mighty in the scriptures. He understood only the baptism of John. And so Paul and Aquila and Priscilla had just come from Corinth to Ephesus. Paul stayed there a little while. They asked him to stay longer. He said no, and he left to go down to Syria and Antioch. Meanwhile, here's Aquila and Priscilla. They're left there. Now, here comes Apollos. Uh, he preaches the baptism of John. And Aquila and Priscilla heard him and took him aside and expounded unto him the way of God more accurately. And when he was minded to go down to Corinth... Then the brethren, verse 27, wrote for him a letter of introduction to the Corinthian church. What does that tell us? It tells us that the church was in existence because it says the brethren wrote the letter. Now, who was it that established the church at Ephesus? Beats me. Could have been Paul. You could argue it, but it's probably not. Well, Aquil and Priscilla had every capability of establishing that church. Who established the church at Ephesus? Don't know. But it existed before Acts 19. When Paul came back to Ephesus, found certain disciples, disciples to John, and they hadn't been baptized to receive the Holy Spirit, and so Paul corrected the matter, and they were baptized, verse 5, into the name of 
the Lord Jesus. Notice that. They were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. He had just given them the authoritative word of the Lord, and they obeyed it. Then he laid his hands on these 12 men that had just been baptized into the name of Christ. They became his possession, and they began to speak with tongues, and they received the empowering of the Spirit, thus making a distinction between the indwelling of the Spirit and the empowering of the Spirit. Now, Paul is there for three years. He goes into the school of Tyrannus for two years, and all of Asia heard the word of God, but he's there for three years. And they begin to get used to him, I guess. Here's the magnificent apostle Paul with all the authority of an apostle there, and yet apostasy takes place in the church of Christ at Ephesus. Look at verse 11. Highly significant. What does he say? He says, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, insomuch that unto the sick were carried away from his body handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed, and the evil spirits went out. Wonderful, marvelous deeds. Why? And we find that my Bible says, then came some strolling Jews. Now, your Bible may say itinerant preachers. These fellows claimed to be exorcists. That is, they claimed to be able to cast out demons. Well, they were a bunch of charlatans. They couldn't do it. Now, let's learn something about Ephesus. We find from recent uh, scholarship is stating that Ephesus, being the third largest city in the Roman Empire, probably had anywhere between 250 to 400. 100,000 people. And the place was completely saturated, as our brother clearly showed us yesterday from his research, that the city was filled with paganism. Ephesus was a hold of magicians. It was a haven for those who practiced the black arts. Ephesus was the very center of the worship of Artemis, whom the Romans called Diana. She was the supreme goddess, but there were other gods that were there. Hecate, and uh, the, the god of wine, a horrible uh, god to worship by the name of Dionysus and other gods. The place was filled with them. Now, these people across the Roman Empire, but particularly here in Western Asia Minor, they had a terrible, terrible view of life that many people have in Lubbock, Texas today and all over the world. And your missionaries who've lived in foreign third world countries can give you illustrations of this. I can give you a couple. They actually believed that there were evil spirits that dominated every phase and facet of their lives. If they got sick, if they lost their job, if somebody broke a leg, if they had a terrible thing happen, they'd say, oh, what have I done to offend the gods? Because everything that happened that was bad was from those evil spirits. So how do they get out from under this horrible pressure uh, that they had to live under. They actually believed in the gods and the goddesses. And these were evil spirits. These are gods and goddesses that the Greeks had created centuries before. And through magical incantations, they would appeal to the gods and goddesses who would then obligate them. That's the idea of magic. And these gods and goddesses then were obligated by those incantations to come to these people and deliver them from the persecution from these evil spirits. Now, if you go to your computer and just type in magical papyri, that's all you got to do, and you'll find coming up on there some of the very magical incantations that were being stated by the Ephesians when Paul was there. Clinton Arnold, in his superb book, Ephesians, Power and Magic, makes it clear that one of the incantations they had was called the aphasia grammata. And that means the naming of the names. And there were five or six names there, among which, by the way, one was our Lord's name. And if they call these names right, or it wouldn't work, if they put them in the right order so it would work, then this would obligate the gods whose names they call to come and rescue them from these evil spirits. Now, this aphasia grammata had a name. It was called naming the names. There's the idea. So now then, look back over here at Ephesians 9, at Acts 19, 
where Paul is working special miracles. Here comes these so-called exorcists. They can't cast out demons, but Paul not only could, he was casting them out, and he did it verbally. It's obvious because he would say, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Because it says here in verse 13, they took upon them to name over them that had the evil spirits the name of Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. Well, to, to them this was just a magical incantation. But it's an abbreviated form of naming the names. He named the name of Jesus. Well, you know the story. Here is the man in whom the evil spirit is, and he says, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who in the world are you? That's my translation. And so he leaped upon them, mastered them both, and they went out of that house naked and wounded. Now watch verse 17. This is significant. It states, and all of Ephesus heard that, got wind of it, and magnified the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, this shows you that the Lord here is the one over all of the lords and the gods and the evil spirits that are there at Ephesus. He's magnifying the name, the authority. Remember Acts 4 and verse 12, there is no other name under heaven given among men, wherein we must be saved. That name here is his authority. There is no other authority but Jesus Christ. That's the one Lord. And this is exalted. But now here comes the big significant statement in verse 18 and 19. Look at it. It states, And many of them that believe, we're talking about Christians, three years of Christianity with the apostle right there in their midst. And it says, many of them that believe came confessing and declaring their deeds. After they saw Paul cast out demons in the name of Christ, it sounds to me like these apostates who had reverted back to their own pagan belief and their own pagan practices were calling on the names of the gods, rejected Jesus as the Lord God with the power to take care of all of the forces of evil that affect your life. And so it states, many of them that believed came confessing and declaring their deeds, and they brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all and counted the price of them, 50,000 pieces of silver. You could buy a pretty big lib library with that kind of money. They spent it on incantations. They had reverted back to their old pagan beliefs and their old pagan practices, and Paul corrected the matter. That's why God works special miracles by the hands of Paul in order to elevate the name of Christ above all the names that were there. And so it states down here in verse 20, So mightily grew the word of the Lord and prevailed. Now, he corrects it. He leaves. And anywhere from 8 to 12 years Later, he writes the Ephesian letter. In the Ephesian letter, he begins, first rattle out of the box in verse 3, goes through verse 14, and he exalts Jesus Christ as Lord, accord, and the fulfillment of every bit of God's grand plan, his purpose from eternity to save man. And after he praises Jesus Christ, then he turns into prayer beginning in verse 15, chapter 1. Now look down here at verse 18 with me. Paul is praying a threefold prayer. We're going to look at the third part. He says, I'm praying that you might know. He's praying for the church. They might know something. What? The exceeding greatness of his power towards usward who believe. Now, I didn't say anything about giving you power. He's talking about exerting the power that God exerts in behalf of the church. And so he says, I want you to know the exceeding greatness, the exceeding greatness of his power toward usward who believe, according to that working of the strength of his power, and he's going to illustrate it now. How powerful is the power that God exerts to, in behalf of the church of Christ? He says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Supreme power. What kind of power is it where you can raise the dead? Well, it goes beyond description. And yet Paul says, wait a minute, I'm not finished. He says he raised him the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, at his right hand. What scripture did he just quote? I want to hear it. 110th Psalm, verse 1. 
The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies the footstool of thy feet. A man at the right hand of God has what? All authority. That's right. And he says, The Lord will send forth the rod of thy strength out of Zion. And in verse 5 he says, The Lord at thy right hand will strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. Look at the lordship power of Jesus Christ. Now Paul says he raised him from the dead. I'm explaining to you that exceeding power that he operates in exercises in behalf of the church. That's people, you and me. And he says that when he raised him from the dead, set him in his right hand in the heavenly places. Listen carefully. Set him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion every name that is named. He used the very language of the aphasia gramata. Why? In order to show Jesus Christ is the one Lord with all that power. And why did he say what he said? Unless these Ephesians had gone back again to their old pagan belief and their old pagan practice. And what Paul is saying to these Ephesians 8, 10, 12 years after what we read about in Acts 19, they reverted back. He says, look, don't call upon the names of those gods that don't exist. They can't help. Call only on the name of the one Lord. There's only one Lord. That is what he appealed to. And after Paul describes this indescribable power that the Lord has, he then says, and he gave him to be head over what? Doesn't say the church. Doesn't say it. Now Ephesians 5, 22, he's the head of the church. 22 and 3. Colossians 1, 24, he's the head of the church. Colossians 1, 18. But this doesn't say he's the head of the church. It says he's head over all things to the church. In your NIV it says head over all things for, in behalf of the church. And that's what he said. I'm praying that you might know the exceeding greatness of his power towards usward who believe. And so he exerts that power in behalf of the church. What is he doing? He has control over all things in behalf of the church to get the great job of world evangelism done. But here in this application, if we find here that there's a division between Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians, then we would have different authorities and that would produce division even as we recognize it today. Where's the division today? It comes from whatever authority you put your confidence in. And if you have an authority, the source of authority different than mine, we just cannot have unity. So he says to these Christians, folks, there's one Lord. There's one authority. And that authority is not only the only source of our salvation, it is the source upon which we must have agreement and solve all of our problems. Oh, thank God for that Lord. There is no other like him. There is one Lord. 